live or to listen to it after? How's it, how's it sound? Is it good? Good. Very good. You get him, you get him straight, Cherish? Good. Okay, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. And today we're going to talk about the parable of the sower. Matthew 13. The parable of the sower teaches us really two perspectives, something from two perspectives. It teaches us something that we need to learn from the perspective of the teacher, that is us, but it also teaches us something that we need to learn from the perspective of a student, which is also us. Every Christian has the dual responsibility of not only being a teacher, but also being a student. Now, if for some reason, the microphone cuts off, (laughs) if for some reason you find yourself being a student but not being a teacher, a lot of the times the reason why you're not being a teacher is because you're not being a student in the right way. Let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, Hold your place here at Matthew 13, of course, because that's going to be our main text. And take a look at Hebrews uh, for just a moment. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. The Hebrews writer says this in chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. Concerning him, that is Melchizedek, He's talking about types and shadows of the old law. He says, Concerning him we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. Now, so, really these people, they become lazy listeners, is how you could say that dull of hearing. They become lazy listeners. They're not being a student like they ought to be. They were learning some stuff. They they had heard. Some, uh, they were they were taking in this milk and reading reading the Hebrews writers' letters, reading Paul's letters, listening to their you know Sunday school teacher or what have you. But they had become lazy listeners. They'd become dull of hearing. So because they weren't a student correctly, they weren't being a student in the right way. They couldn't be a teacher in the right way. And so Paul uh, condemns them for this, and he is going to get them back to where they need to be. They should have been teachers, but they had messed up. They hadn't learned in the right way. And so if we don't learn how to be a student first, then there's no way that we're going to be able to be a teacher. And so when we read the parable of the sowers, going back to Matthew 13, uh, we need to keep these this two perspectives in mind. We don't need to just think of it as if we're out teaching people, but we need to also think of it as if we are uh, students ourselves, which we are. In Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And large crowds gathered, uh, gathered to him, so he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seed fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depths of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they did not have, or because they had not root, they withered away. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now the explanation of this parable. Uh, is found down in verses 18 and following. While I would love to read verses 10 to 17, we're going to skip over that just for time's sake. Look at verse 18. He says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places... This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And on the one whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of the wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it. He goes on to say, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So here we have four categories of people uh, that hear the word of God. And we don't just need to ask, 
you know, how can we evaluate the people that we're teaching? What kind of ground are they? But we also need to ask ourselves the question, what kind of ground are we when we're studying God's Word? Because your growth in Christianity doesn't stop at the baptistry. Your growth in Christianity continues on and on and on for the rest of your life until the day that you die. The uh, God, of course, is infinite in knowledge and wisdom, and the book that He's given us is the same way. There's no way that you're going to be able to learn everything there is to learn about the Bible. If you think, if you think that's the case, uh, once you read it in English, then go try to learn how to read it in Greek. And now go try to learn how to read it in Hebrew and Aramaic. And go study other... You know, there's so much Bible study that you can do, even just in the English, that it will take up your entire life. And if you think you got it all down, Pat, then write us a commentary, because we, really <laughs> we really need the perfect truth on some of these things. And your wisdom will help us out a lot. So we need to evaluate what type of ground we are. Because whether you are in 6th grade, or whether you're 65 years old, or 80 years old, or whatever, you're still learning, you're still growing, and you need to be sure that you're the right kind of ground. Now the question that arises is, who determines what kind of ground you are? Let me show you a passage uh, that some people might use to, uh, to, to answer that question. Go with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6 and uh, 6 and 7. He says, Paul says that is, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth, or God gave the increase. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. And so some may say, when they're looking at Matthew 13, some may say, well, uh, you might just be by nature just bad ground. And you're never going to be able to understand God's Word. And some people are just going to be lost. That's just how God made them. In other words, it's this idea of predestination. Um, Some people are just destined to be lost. And some people are just destined to be saved. Because it's God that gives the increase. It's the Holy Spirit that gives the increase. But this way of thinking is not necessarily true. Look in Luke chapter 11 for a moment. And notice God's answer to this question. Because it is God that gives the increase... But God gives the increase to a particular type of people. And I'm going to illustrate this in a very uh, easy way to understand here in a moment. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 10, the Bible says this, For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. The previous verse, of course, he said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So who does God give increase to? God doesn't give increase to the one who's dormant, the one who's a lazy listener, a dull of hearing from Hebrews chapter 5, but he gives increase to the one who's diligently, willingly trying to study and trying to grow and trying to gain increase. That's who God gives that to. You recall in the book of James, the church was going uh, through severe persecution. And God told them, he said, well, if you'll simply just ask for wisdom... To get through this persecution, I'll give it to you. He talked about, paraphrase of course, talked about that in James chapter 1. And he says, you know, he says to them, you have not because you ask not. We, we learned that principle in scriptures. So the point is, is that who does God give increase to? What kind of ground are you? Well, that's completely up to you. If you're willing to be good ground, you can be that way. If you're willing to be bad ground or not willing to be any ground at all, you're going to fall into that bad ground category. Now, these different types of ground um, are demonstrated for us in Scripture. The Bereans would be akin to the good ground, who they study the Scriptures daily to see whether these things are so, right? And by the way, uh, the Bereans, what Scriptures would they have been studying? They have been studying the Old Testament Scriptures, which gives us an insight into how we need to utilize the entirety of the Word of God and not just the New Testament or just the Old Testament. Um, and using all of God's word is beneficial to our spiritual growth. The one who does not hear the word at all, well, that's kind of like these Pharisees that we talked about earlier today uh, from Mark chapter, rather, uh, Matthew chapter 23. Remember, they were shutting up the kingdom of God and they weren't going to answer, they weren't going to enter in themselves. They're going and taking away this good seed from these people. The, 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 Jesus planted the seed and they would go and take it away and not allow people to enter into the kingdom of God. That's similar to what's happening here in uh, Matthew, chapter, Matthew chapter 13. 
Another type of ground in Matthew chapter 13 uh, is the ground, the thorny ground. When the cares of this world, and really the uh, literal transla- translation of that would be the, the cares of this age came about, they would rather have the cares of the age than the cares of God, the riches of God. We learn about a man like that. I'm kind of flying through these, but just giving you some illustrations. A man named Demas uh, in Paul's epistles to Timothy. He loved this present world so much that he left Paul behind and uh, you know, to basically fend for himself. But, of course, Timothy and others were remaining faithful to him. That You can find that about reading about Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Demas, having loved this present world, he falls under uh, what would you would consider the, uh, the thorny ground here for Matthew chapter 13. Then you have this other ground that has uh, temporary faith until affliction comes about. And, you know, you read about this um, throughout the epistles where God encourages them to stay strong, to comfort one another so that they don't fall away. A particular case of this, uh, for example, would be in the discourse that Jesus gives on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24. He talks about how the love of many would wax cold in the time of these severe persecutions. Many would fall away because of the persecutions. that They would lose their faith in God. So you have these different types of ground, and these types of ground are illustrated in Scripture. Now let me give you a small illustration to show you that it's up to you what type of ground you want to be. Consider when you were younger, and your parent or your guardian or whomever was giving you a command. You know, go do this, go do that. Some days... You know, you were willing to go and do it. You just went ahead and cleaned that room, got it done, and so you go outside and play. Other days, you poke around and you don't want to do it, you don't feel like it. And so that shows you that the type of ground that you are can change on a day-to-day basis. And the same is true with the Word of God. If we are attentive and willing to hear, then we're going to hear. But if we're being stubborn, like we were when we were young, and like we are now when we're old, (laughs) then we're not going to be able to hear. You see what I'm saying? You get the idea? And so it's up to you how you perceive and, and how the Word of God affects you. Okay, You can be good, the good ground, you can be the bad ground. This all comes down to your willingness to seek, to knock, to ask. Okay, If you don't seek, if you don't knock, and you don't ask, then you're not going to come to the, to the truth of God's Word. You're not going to grow as you should. You're not going to be able to be a teacher. <clears throat> now let's uh, consider, just for a moment then, the authority of Scriptures. We know that scriptures are our highest authority when it comes to you know, things of religion. Whether it comes to how we worship, how we live, how we act, uh, how we communicate with each other, how we interact with each other. The highest authority that we have is scriptures. Other things that are man-made, such as commentaries and uh, bulletin articles and study helps, those things are good, but they don't beat scripture. In other words, scripture trumps everything else. Now that just gives you a little insight uh, into how you should treat the Word of God. Not only should you be open to what it says, but you should be open to it as the final authority on things. If something that you read in a book or something that you read out of something that I write or something that I say doesn't conform to what the Bible says, then you should discard that for God's Word. It's the Word of God that's able to bring about... uh, it's, It's the Word of God that's able to bring about eternal life and not the word of man. Go for an instance with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's take a look at that. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, he says this beginning in verse 1, or verse 17 rather. If you address as father the one who impartially judges, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. If you address as the Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was known for, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, 
fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again. Here we go. Not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. Then he gives a quote from Isaiah. He says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Now they had these traditions from the fathers, as you see up there, uh, vain traditions from the fathers, um, in the previous section, verse 18. But these old ways that they had received from the fathers, they were nothing compared to the word of God. The word of God trumps those things. Not only was that true for them in that day, but it's true for us today as well. Just because you have something that you've received uh, from a generation before, from someone that you know, has some letters after their name, does not mean that that is on equal level with God's word. God's word always trumps everything else. We talked for a moment today, I think uh, it was Jimmy that mentioned about the Catholic Catechism, right? But all those questions and answers that they give within that document are nothing compared to the Word of God. The Word of God is uh, able to make man perfect unto every good work, as 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17 says. Let's get back to uh, Matthew 13, but I want you to uh, hold your place there, and we're going to flip between two passages. Matthew chapter 13 and Romans chapter 10. And I want to show you something interesting. This was pointed out in Bible class, and I think it complements the lesson well. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, and compare that to Romans chapter 10, and verse 2. He says this, For I testify about them, that is about Israel, that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. A zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Now this means you have, again, four categories of people. You have the good ground, which is the people that have zeal and have the knowledge. You have the people that are just uh, the, the wayside, the, the side of the road where the birds come and scoop them up, right? And that is no zeal and no knowledge. They didn't even allow the Word of God to, to penetrate their hearts. It just washes away like water off a duck's back. Then you have this category where they have the zeal, but they have no knowledge. And so this category would be uh, whenever the cares of this world get in the way and they don't have any knowledge of what's really out there and they choose that over the other. Then you have this other category of people that have no zeal, but they have the knowledge. These are the people in Matthew 13 who receive the word gladly, but whenever tribulations and troubles get in their way, they get you know, they get, uh, they get sidetracked and go back into the way that they once lived. And so you see Romans chapter 10 and verse 2 really goes well and complements the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. You can have zeal and knowledge, which is what we should all strive for. You can have zeal and no knowledge, which is what a lot of people have, and you see what kind of trouble that gets them into. It got the Pharisees into a lot of trouble, and it got Paul into a lot of trouble. Having zeal and no knowledge caused Paul a whole lot of grief. You recall that even he calls himself the chief of all sinners in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because with his own hands he persecuted the church. He saw to Stephen's death in Acts chapter 7. And so that was a case where he had zeal but he had no knowledge. And he caused a lot of harm because of that. The other category though is having knowledge and having... Again, if you, if you, just to know God's word isn't enough. You have to apply it to your life. It has to be able to be seen in your life. Otherwise, again, you're, you're just throwing that knowledge away. Demas had the knowledge, but because he didn't have zeal, he left Paul and went back into the way that he once lived. A lot of people here, we know that we have knowledge, but you can probably think a time in your life when you lost that zeal. And that just goes to show you again how you can move from category to category depending on the day, depending on how you prepare yourself uh, to live that day. You're familiar with the expression that failure to plan is planning to fail. And that's true not only in the secular world, but in our, in our Christian lives as well. If we don't plan to be the good ground, if we don't plan to allow the Word of God to, uh, to control our lives, then we too are going to just fall by the wayside, so to speak. And then, of course, there's a the category of no knowledge and no zeal. This describes a person that has no willingness at all to serve God. They don't care about God. They don't care what Jesus has done for them. They they may not even believe in it at all. 
And of course, they don't have any zeal uh, to pursue anything in their life. They just basically live uh, dormant. So again, the first half of the lesson is this. What ground are you, and what are you going to do to make sure that you're the good ground? The second half of the lesson, and I say half just to sort of scare you, but it's not really a half. The second half of the lesson is this. Uh, What can you do when you encounter these various types of ground? What do you do when you encounter someone who is that wayside category? Who it it seems like the Word of God just doesn't even affect them at all. Again, think about yourself. What do we learn? It's possible to go from category to category in your life, depending on you know how you wake up that morning or what you how you've prepared yourself uh, to you know to receive excuse me to receive the Word of God. And so it's also possible for other people to do that as well. This means you shouldn't give up. Go with me in your Bible to First Peter. To First Peter. Now, you do, you're familiar with this expression that you shouldn't cast your pearls before swine. Uh, but that's an extreme case. In 1 Peter chapter 3, notice this, for example, in verse 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of the wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. The point here, he had some Christian women that had some husbands that were either unfaithful or or not uh, Christians to begin with. And what Peter is telling them is, hey, if you live in a certain way, if you behave a certain way, you can actually save that person without ever even speaking a word. And this is the advice that I would give to you when you encounter someone who is neither a person who has knowledge or a person who has zeal. Or maybe they have the wrong type of knowledge and zeal. If they're not willing to hear what you have to tell them, If you live in such a way to be a good influence to them, then you can save them without ever speaking a word. That will change the type of ground that they are and open them up to what the Bible says. Now, what doesn't help? Okay? If you're not consistent, if you're not consistent, for example, with taking allergy medicine, what happens? You go right back into coughing and sneezing and things like that. You know, the allergy medicine doesn't help if you're not consistent with taking it. Same is true when you're trying to teach somebody about God's Word. If you're not consistent, and I'm not talking about sitting down with them and studying, but the way he's talking about here, living a good life. If you're not consistently living a good life in their presence, that's not going to work. That's just as effective as taking your allergy medicine only once you know, every five days. It's not going to do you any good. You have to be consistent with it. You have to present not only... uh, you know, an outward presence of Christianity, but an inward presence of Christianity. Now, what you say, okay, everybody falls. When I fall, is that going to hurt their perception of the truth? Well, it might, but if you stand back up after you fall and repent, that's going to show them that you have, you know, even more integrity than they knew before. Um, And so, you can change somebody's type of ground based on the way that you live. If we move through the other examples, no zeal, no knowledge, then we go to uh, zeal, zeal with no knowledge, then we can understand how we can help that person as well. They have the zeal to follow God. All they need to do is see it for themselves in the Bible. If you show them something in the Bible and they still don't see it the way that you see it, all right, then there's something that that you haven't uncovered. You haven't uncovered the true problem that they have with whatever you just said. There's something, so you've got to dig with them. You have to be a little bit more patient with that person that has the zeal but does not have the knowledge. If you have the knowledge... If you encounter somebody with the knowledge but doesn't have the zeal, then what can you do? You have to find a way to impart that zeal into their life. One of my favorite verses to read when I find myself in a situation where I have uh, knowledge but not zeal is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and this is a passage I've shared with you before because it's one of my favorites. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14 says this, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded that one died for all, therefore all died. In other words, how can I have zeal when I don't usually, if I, if I run out of zeal in my life, I turn to this passage and I think to myself what Christ has done for me, what he was willing to do for me, and allow that love to flow through me and come forth in my life. You see what I'm saying? 
So you find a passage or two that, that helps you have zeal whenever you're feeling down in the dumps, and maybe that passage will help out your friend who has the knowledge but doesn't have the zeal. And then finally, you come to someone who has the zeal and has the knowledge. And what you should do with them is uh, you should do uh, with them what the church at Philippi did for Paul. If you read the book of Philippians, it's mainly a thank you letter. Uh, Go with me to Philippians chapter 1, and we'll see what you can do with somebody who has the knowledge as well as the zeal. You know, the, the, the letter to the Philippians is one of the only letters that Paul wrote that doesn't really have any... Thing, uh, two things negative to say to the church. There's only one little bitty instance uh, with argument between uh, some, a, tr- a trouble that some women were having there in uh, Philippians 4 verse 2, but besides that, the entire letter is positive and mainly a thank you letter. And here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering, with pr- always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who had began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you, about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers, excuse me, you all are partakers of grace with me. And he says in verse 8 and 9, For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment. So what do you do for someone who already has the knowledge and the zeal? You thank them for it. You appreciate the good example they have for you in your life. And not only that, but you encourage them to continue to grow in knowledge, to continue to grow in zeal, on and on to that person that, that Christ would have them to be. To, to be able to be a full picture of Jesus uh, in their life. And so, one thing that we forget about, one category that we forget about, is this category of good knowledge and good zeal. You know, we're always quick to try to help the one who has no knowledge and no zeal, or zeal and no knowledge, or knowledge, or, uh, uh, you know, okay, but sometimes we forget that the person who has good knowledge and good zeal the person who's at good ground just need, needs just as much encouragement as these other categories do. And so we should be willing to do our best to, uh, to encourage and to thank those people that are doing uh, what God would have them to be because they need the encouragement just as much as everybody else. And we know that from our own lives. You know, it feels good when someone tells you, hey, thank you, keep it up, keep up what you're doing, you're a great example in my life. That's one of the greatest compliments you can receive. And it's something that we should uh, not be not be slow to give one another to help encourage each other in a time of need because there's coming a day when each of us are probably going to follow into, the, into one of these categories where we let our study of the Bible slack or we let our zeal sort of drip down and we're not feeling ourselves that day and we're going to need somebody to come and pat us on the back and, uh, and to help us get back up. So let's, let's keep this in mind. To summarize, what kind of ground are you when you study God's Word? Are you that good ground or are you the bad ground? And what are you going to do to change it or to to fertilize that ground to make it good? What are some passages that you might read uh, every day maybe even to remind yourself about the power of God's Word and and the importance of following it and studying it and teaching it to others? What are you going to do to help out your fellow Christians who might be falling into one of these uh, uh, more um, sad categories? And what are you going to do to help yourself get out of it whenever you're in that category? So these are the questions that we, we need to ask ourselves day to day because, again, uh, you know, Christianity doesn't stop at the baptistry. It's something that we need to prepare ourselves for every day when we wake up in the morning and every night when we go to bed because it's a lifelong journey. It's a transformation. And a, batter, a butterfly uh, doesn't get dried off from the water and then turn back into a caterpillar. <laughs> we have to continue to grow and to continue to let the beauty of Christ to be seen in us. Uh, if you're here today and you have not yet become a Christian, or maybe you have, but you've uh, found yourself slip into one of these other categories that we talked about, and you need some encouragement. Let us know. We'll pray for you and, and comfort you. And if you need to become a Christian, we can get that done today and study with you more in that. Does anybody have uh, such a need? All right. Uh, then I'll see you all tonight at 5 o'clock for Sunday evening Bible class. Right back here. And if you can't make it because of work, you can always go online. Hey, Jaden, can you, oh, did Cherish go get it? Oh, Jaden, can you do it? Um, 
you can always listen online at christiansinarcadia.org and uh, come in and you know, whatever you want to do there, ask us questions and we'll do our best to help you. At this time then, we're going to be dismissed with a closing prayer and uh, Gary Burford's going to lead us.